So again, thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Edward Bartholomew, and I am going to share my screen. Uh, myself and Glenn, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. It's great to join you remotely. Looks like you were having a great party. And uh, um, I just want to say it's, it's great to see folks supporting each other and being there and having a good time in person. Um, we haven't had too, too many of those happening in Boston. So uh, we look forward to, to doing the same. And with that, I will get going. So light justice in practice. Um, as all of you know, that light is a very powerful symbol of knowledge and truth and, and justice um, and the power of light, uh, how it works within our lives. But not everyone gets access to the benefits of, of good lighting and benevolent darkness. Uh, Well-designed, high-quality lighting, as many of you know, is a signifier of prosperity and privilege. It's, um, of course, appealing and environmentally responsible and socially beneficial. And it's a great long-term investment um, in the acceptance and performance and value of a place, a building, and a community. Though it's not always, light is not always necessarily good and marginalized under-resourced communities often suffer from poor lighting, which can be not just visually distressing and environmentally harmful, but also socially detrimental. It can actually cause and be a, a point of surveillance and oppression for these communities. They don't enjoy the benefits of good lighting. So in many ways, this is part of uh, a systemic uh, impact or oppression that occurs. And uh, it kind of relates to a lot of inequalities that are happening within our society in general. So it has historic and persistent roots, but by recognizing these inequalities, uh, we as a lighting community, we can event, re begin addressing, recognizing, identifying, and healing uh, these issues and help revitalize these underserved places as with the ways and the skills that we know so well. Uh, environmental justice is an important part of uh, the struggle to improve and maintain a clean and health, healthful environment, especially for those who have traditionally lived, worked, and played closest to the sources of pollution, such as landfills or industrial plants. Now, to quote the father of environmental justice, Dr. Robert Ballard, it is the right of all individuals to have clean, safe, livable, and sustainable environment. The goal is, not, is to not allow artificial characteristics such as race, class, or geography to impede that right. And the Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice challenges that impact communities of color as lead contamination or unhealthy drinking water, dangerous air quality, hazardous waste site exposure, but overexposure to harmful lighting is not listed. And this raises a kind of an urgent question about how we as lighting professionals can understand and address environmental justice inequities. Does lighting have an environmental justice impact? And how can we address the harm caused by environmental justice? Now we all know what good lighting looks like. Uh, we've given awards and attended award ceremonies and worked on many projects. Um, we know that it's both visually attractive, environmental, environmentally, hopefully environmentally benign, but definitely socially positive. It adds a lot to the communities and, and neighbors and, and uh, people who, who are impacted by these projects. But as Isabella Crutura says, light's ability to characterize space is either appealing or unappealing. Hers is divisions that already exist between rich and poor. So she wrote that in her article in the Brown Political uh, Review titled Public Lighting and the Urban Wealth Gap. So inequities can be exasperated. And, and we, in many ways as an industry, have, have participated in exasperating those inequities. 
Now, there are, we all know that there are aspects in how to do good lighting. We take these recommendations very seriously. We're focusing today on outdoor lighting. So these five design principles were developed through a collaboration clearly with the IES and the International Dark Sky. And they spell out prescriptively exactly what we should be doing. The lighting should be useful, targeted, low light levels, controlled, and clearly warmer color temperature lights can help on LEDs have enabled all of these aspects. And we think about this as really these recommended practices are the ways that we invest in good lighting in communities, in the communities that we serve. And the same goes for darkness. Uh, when we look at beneficial darkness, um, we want darkness that is comforting, um, such as the coolness of mature trees and shade, uh, reduce minimal outdoor lighting so that it's not producing uh, light pollution. Uh, we know that darkness is an amenity that many affluent neighborhoods enjoy uh, because they recognize that darkness is, is an amenity, is important. And so a reduction in light is, is truly something that's embraced and a connection to the sky and to darkness is really embraced. But what is beneficial darkness? As I mentioned, affluent neighborhoods, they, they tend to have the appropriate darkness balanced with visually comfortable outdoor lighting at night. Uh, but marginalized communities tend to lack the type of mature trees and shade and suffer some, some substandard lighting at night, which denies them the benefits of nighttime darkness. And it's getting worse. It, night pollution in general, light pollution in general has increased. A recent study that used satellite imagery to determine that observable light emissions have increased by at least 49% from the period of 1992 to 2017, and it's only getting worse. To quote Celeste Henry at the University of Texas in Austin, indeed in the US, the urban poor, the black and the brown communities corralled in the inner cities by processes of white flight and racial criminalization have suffered under this trajectory of illumination. And what is the impact? Light pollution is inequitable. In a landmark study, called Light Pollution Inequities in the Continental United States, a Distributive Environmental Justice Analysis. Researchers from the University of Utah and several other universities concluded that light pollution is an emergent environmental health hazard. First, that environmental justice study of, was the first study of, of exposure to ambient light at night in the USA. It pointed out the social inequities and in exposure to light pollution across urban and rural context. It looked at Hispanic, Black, Asian, and multi-other race residents and found that they reside in brighter areas. They're able to take the satellite imagery, drill down to the addresses below and determine from the demographics who's being impacted by the overlighting. So low to mid social economic status residential areas were exposed to more light at night than affluent neighborhoods. And there's history to this. One of the roots is really looking at the legacy of how lighting is utilized as a form of surveillance. Lantern laws, which represent the earliest attempt to use light at nighttime to suppress black bodies through racialized surveillance um, in Simone, Simone Brown's book, The Dark Matter States, they were laws from the 18th century in both New York City and Boston that demanded that black mixed race and indigenous enslaved people had to carry candle lanterns with them if they walked about in the city after sunset and not in the company of a white person. And it, the law prescribed that anybody was deputized to punish those who did not carry the supervisory device. Another aspect in looking at this are sundown towns. Sundown towns, and there are 10,000 of them in the US uh, between 1890 and 1960. These were towns where if you were uh, black or other minorities, um, you could not be in that town when, when, at sundown. You could work there during the day. You could do other things during the day, but once the sun was down, you had to leave those towns. Um, otherwise you'd face you know, harassment um, and use of violence. Um, and this is, was pretty common back then to control nocturnal behavior. 
control who was where and when. And so the Green Book was actually, and those who saw the movie, was actually a book that helped uh, mostly Black people navigate the U.S. and find places that were safe for lodging and food so they could avoid sundown towns, so they could avoid the harassment of traveling in those towns. So again, controlling people at night, controlling their behavior at night is something that has historic roots in America. Another aspect of this is looking at redlining. Redlining is a practice that started in the 1930s and characterized certain neighborhoods or areas of high credit risk. So often on the basis of race and ethnicity, for those who live there, who basically deny loan applications from credit worthy borrowers simply because they live in those neighborhoods. So while the practice was outlawed in 1968, its effects have been passed down over the years. And it really speaks to the inequities between races because property is one of the fastest ways to gain wealth in America. So they've noticed that the gap in wealth and home ownership in three out of the four neighborhoods that were redlined on government maps 80 years ago still continue to struggle economically. Another way that lighting is often used is ways to surveil people. And so lighting has now been freighted it with a lot of other you know, technologies, cameras, shot detectors, um, other types of technologies have now gone on top of lighting. So lighting is not simply a, a benign type of device, but it creates another method for people to be watched. The Panopticon um, that Foucault talks about really came, was devised by Jeremy B Bantham in the 18th century. And it was a disciplinary tool for, for criminals where they always felt watched. So Foucault mentions this, the famous philosopher, how the panopticon creates a consciousness of permanent visibility as a form of power, where no bars, chains, or heavy locks are necessary for domination anymore. And he just points out just how pervasive that can feel to people there and how it changes their behavior when you feel you're permanently being watched. Project Greenlight is an effort in Detroit where basically green lights were placed on uh, different retail establishments that had cameras where people were being watched. So this became a effort to show that, you know, you know, if you're doing anything, you're always gonna be watched if you have, if you're in sight of that green light. So Project Greenlight was pervasive throughout Detroit and uh, it, it had some mixed results. Some people enjoyed it and some people really felt oppressed by having cameras everywhere, only in their neighborhoods. They were not in wealthier neighborhoods. So to quote Tawana Petty, black communities who have been under-resourced and ignored for decades want to be seen and not watched. So how do we, again, address these issues? Well, one of the most egregious examples of this is actually called omnipresence. This is actually happening right now in New York City. Uh, we all know about the tragic events that happened in New York City recently, but the New York City police um, has a program that's located in housing projects throughout Brooklyn. And as I recall, there's actually one or two actually in Manhattan. I'd have to check on that. But it's basically called Omnipresence. And fundamentally, they put up diesel powered generators with tall floodlights and they place them in housing projects adjacent to parks and these are prominently marked with New York Police Department and all they do is cast this really intense harsh floodlight in these areas. Now the intent is to reduce crime but the impact you have to separate intent from impact. Impact is that it truly makes these places unlivable and very uncomfortable. Uh, it's, as some of the residents described it as overwhelming. The lights shine in people's rooms, making it hard for people to, uh, for them to sleep. The noise never turns off. These diesel generators are on all night. The buzz of the generator never stops. This is actually a view from inside one of the residences. 
So this is going on only in poor, underserved neighborhoods. This is not happening in wealthy neighborhoods at all. So you ask, why would this happen and how, why does it persist? This inequity that's happening with harsh lighting, uh, oppressive lighting, surveillance lighting, surveillance strategies. Well, there was a study that was done and it recently came out called Reducing Crime Through Environmental Design, Evidence from a Randomized Experiment in Street Lighting in New York City. And that study stated that street lighting can reduce outdoor neck uh, nighttime index crimes, those are the most heinous type of crimes, by approximately 36%. The study was done in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, and a focus in the database where they got the information for this study was based on the New York City Police Department's omnipresence program. So it's a very flawed study. And what they found is that where omnipresence was, uh, even though it was an oppressive intervention, um, that is perceived by the residents as hostile and stigmatizing, um, they did not really study the, the impact of permanent lighting, permanent solutions of good lighting in those communities. That was never even looked at. But they assume that a permanent infrastructure upgrade, better lighting, could have additional collateral benefits and that those benefits would persist. So this study has been utilized by cities and towns and policymakers throughout to justify uh, more lighting as reducing crime. And it simply is not true. So what is the impact of these types of things? Well, as I mentioned how the international, um, uh, one study by the International Dark Side Association talking about light pollution is getting rapidly worse, especially with LED outdoor lighting as it proliferates pro proliferates throughout the world. Not only is light pollution bad for obscuring the night sky and disrupting animal behavior, but light pollution is a public health hazard for humans. You could imagine if people embrace those type of crime preventing efforts of flood lighting, that it would just increase to have more light pollution in these neighborhoods and only in those poor and underserved neighborhoods. A recent study found that possible links and these aren't possible links, but they found links or correlated links between excessive outdoor night at light and breast cancer. Many of us in the lighting community are aware of these studies. But if you look at the comprehensive data from more than 100,000 women across the US enrolled in this study from 1989 to 2013, they linked, again, satellite images taken from Earth and taken at nighttime to residential addresses of each of the study participants. And they found that the top 20% of those who were exposed to the highest levels of outdoor lighting at night had an estimated 14% increase in the risk of breast cancer as compared with women at the bottom 20%. The study considered all the compounding issues of night shift work, that, that these workers often live in these same over-lighted neighborhoods. They never escape artificial lighting or have the opportunity to enjoy comfortable darkness. And it also impacts mental health. A cross-sectional study in 2020 looked at um, the survey of US adolescents and found that higher levels of outdoor artificial light at night, again, measured via satellites, were associated with later weeknight bedtimes. I can speak to that with my teenager who's going to bed later and later. And uh, they found that those in the lowest quartile of the nighttime light reported the longest weeknight sleep durations. Well, sleep is being disrupted uh, in these communities and it's impacting their, um, overlighting is impacting their sleep, which impacts behavior. Adolescents in areas with greater levels of nighttime light had higher prevalence of mood and anxiety disorders. So these studies point to how harmful excessive outdoor lighting is. And we understand some of the reasoning for excessive outdoor lighting, but how do we address that? To quote Antoinette B. Carroll, systems of oppression, injustices, and inequities are designed, and therefore they can be redesigned. So if we look at ways that we can participate in this conversation to address some of these inequities, 
it seems that we need to rebalance the lighting design process and truly rethink the lighting designer's role. In the book, Design Justice, Sasha Costanza Chalk says, we see the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. They may not, they may not be the only expert at the table because too often we, uh, as designers, we have to jump in. Typically we have to jump in, you know, maybe during schematic design, often it's a design development after critical decisions have already been made. And then we have to play the role of both the lighting uh, expert or authority prescribing solutions. And we don't even have connections with the communities that are being impacted by these decisions. So we are not really in touch with those, the concerns of the stakeholders. And this results in lighting authoritarianism with us dictating a design without adequate community input or engagement. So design justice speaks to a process that, well, design justice first is an organization, but it's also a process centering people who are normally marginalized by design. And it uses a collaborative creative practice to address the, the deepest challenges that these communities face. It's based on some simple principles. Basically engage, listen, and when appropriate, educate the community as stakeholders. Change the hierarchy from lighting expert to citizen expert. Research and identify historical and environmental inequities. Share knowledge generously. And design and specify with integrity. outputs of design justice are not only to repair for past injustices of the physical environment, but to make them fair in the present and remove barriers for the future. So what Brian Lee um, from Design as Protest is saying here is that it's not enough for us to focus investment, including our resources of time and expertise on areas that have been neglected in the past. We need to meet these communities where they are today and try to understand how light can support their current needs and values and share our knowledge in accessible ways so these communities can establish and maintain positions of power over their nighttime environments in the future. So it's really a, a different set of goals for the designer to address these, this, these aspirations. And we have models where designers are doing exactly this. Um, one of the models, actually, Lenny Schwingdinger, um, actually working with Night Seeing, the program that she started, International Nighttime Design Initiative, uh, uh, that opens people's eyes to existing nighttime environments, including understanding the lighting systems and its effects at night. But she's also part of the International Nighttime Design Initiative, which is a consortium of 30 interdisciplinary academics and professionals who are applying both the vision skills and know-how how to develop a holistic design practices, for urban lighting design, and their efforts support women taking back the night, which intersects with the support of marginal communities. And another advocate is Bob Parks, a, a smart outdoor lighting alliance and his community-friendly lighting program. Uh, those who have taken his workshops know how beneficial this is. Uh, He's, um, it's a street lighting design process that starts with public outreach and engagement. Bob strongly recommends mock-ups to demonstrate how new lighting technology can reduce glare, improve color rendering, all of the issues that we know good quality lighting brings to outdoor lighting. So he does this by engaging the community, doing constant mock-ups and really getting stakeholder input throughout the process. Now the white cross estate um, this is a community engagement work done by the London School of Economics and the Social Light Movement, which brought together 25 lighting designers, architects, planners, social scientists for a week-long workshop with the 1,200 residents of the White Cross Housing Estate in London, England. The aim was to explore how social research can help designers understand these outdoor social spaces and White Cross residents' needs in order to improve the nighttime quality of the estate. Uh, before this interaction, the residents thought of their bad lighting as ubiquitous and something they could not change, just like the concrete or the bricks. But by engaging and working with these designers and these academics, they understood that they could, they could make the changes, they could see these changes and manipulate these changes 
and they could change their environment, their lighting environment. So they became active participants in the process. And I want to point out that there is an organization called lightjustice.org and a website will be launched next week that will serve as both an online resource and a forum for community-based lighting design practices, supporting both the education and advocacy for designers to support underserved communities to improve lighting for both safety, security, and placemaking. You have to stop your screen sharing, Edward. I will. There you go. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to go in. I'm going to present another project um, as a case study of some of these principles of of design justice. Um, consistent with these principles, the Signal Station North project questions the typical processes and outcomes of lighting design. So, based on the issues identified by Edward, we understand this is especially important in historically marginalized communities that have consistently and increasingly been discriminated against using light. The Signal Station North, Station North project um, is a creative placemaking project. Um, we received a Our Town grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, and the focus of the grant was that to look at lighting of public spaces in the, signal, in the Station North Arts District, which is located in central Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Baltimore is a city that was ravaged by suburban flight in the 1970s and 80s leaving areas throughout the city with high vacancy rates, low investment, and a challenged school system. That's the common narrative in the media, but Baltimore is also a city that's rich in culture and history with a vibrant creative community that's committed to equity and inclusion. So the focus on, I'm gonna focus on the outcomes of this project and how they're different than the typical outcomes of our lighting design processes. We understood that if we were going to engage in the goals of design justice, our work needed to extend beyond layouts and fixture selections that provide prescriptive solutions and completed lighting installations. Um, so uh, we were fortunate to work with an amazing interdisciplinary team and to receive funding that supported the development of this new approach to lighting design. Um, when I, in this presentation, I'll refer to we as the team, um, and I'm referring to an incredible Baltimore-based team that included many amazing women, and I'm so humbled to be the one to share this highly collaborative work with you today. Um, our partners included the Neighborhood Design Center. This is a nonprofit located in the Arts District with strong existing ties to the community. Um, Flux Studio, that's our practice. Um, we're also located in the Arts District and we were the lead creative um, lighting, lighting design, light artist, and I'm a lighting educator. Um, we worked with the group Public Mechanics, who's a public artist and graphic and web designer, and then an architect named um, PIKL. So fundamental to our approach was the intent that this work be made available to anyone that could benefit from it. So. You just saw a, a um, capture of our website, and on this website, you, you can download all of the resources that I'll be presenting tonight. So we, had, we were fortunate to have a grant that was open-ended, and so we started by doing an analysis, as we often do in our designs, in an urban analysis to better understand the context and document for lighting. Um, or, and but given our emphasis in this project on the pedestrian experience, we added an analysis of tree canopies to the district and sites that have high visibility. So these were sites where the, high, where the investment priority might have the biggest initial impact. Um, we also prepared a lighting analysis and to understand the community lighting conditions, the trends, the problem areas, the opportunities. Um, this was obviously going to be key to any of our recommendations. Um, and so as is typically the case, we looked at the quantitative and qualitative um, aspects of the existing lighting, but unlike projects where we're hired by an individual property owner um, or a municipality, we focused our, our, our review on issues impacting the pedestrian experience in areas that exist between the public and the private realm. This was another um, aspect of the project that really revealed a new understanding of how these communities were being negatively impacted by light. So this shift in focus led us to understand the nighttime environment that was more related to the lived experience of a person in the community. 
we noted how street lighting was resulting in areas that appeared dark because adjacent areas were overlit. We found some examples of where public lighting was trespassing into domestic spaces. Another departure from our typical processes was an emphasis on sharing basic technical knowledge with community members so that they could have greater power over their nighttime environments in the future. So in our lighting plan, we integrated educational material so viewers could advocate on these issues from a more informed position. Um, the previous examples shows represent some innovations in how we approach the lighting design process, but they're still grounded in producing information, which is the typical outcome of lighting design. Um, now I'll share a few ways that we engaged with the community in a more direct way. So we kicked off the project with a fun community driven event that highlighted the social and transformative power of light. And it was part of a citywide festival called Light City in 2019. So some of you may be familiar with Gorilla Lighting. This is a, a, an event format that was created in the UK that's open source. Um, it was created by the social light movement. And it's an interactive demonstration of this transformative potential of light through collective action. So they, we, we organized these orchestrated and ephemeral lighting compositions that only lasted for the duration of a few photos. Volunteers and the surrounding community came together around light for this one night. Um, and it was an opportunity to experience, even if just for an instant, how light might change their community in positive ways. We circulated around the Arts District to temporarily light a few prominent buildings and sites that don't currently contribute to the nighttime environment. Um, and volunteers, we had 50 volunteers, and they were um, armed with high power flashlights and optical accessories to illumin illuminate four light site locations. We determined in advance where they would position themselves, where they would aim the light, and with the guidance of a small group of team leaders, um, at each site we organized and then took a doc documented a photograph. So this education about small changes in lighting and how they can have dramatic effects was a real byproduct of the event for the volunteers and for people that were watching it. So in this case, just understanding that positioning yourself a little bit further back or aiming the light in a very specific way emphasized the texture of this existing previously unlit um, church building. And so this is a demonstration of how lighting can be accessible to the community that it doesn't only have to be left to the experts. We, we tried to empower them with that understanding that they could have that difference. So hands-on learning or learning from doing um, and demonstrating the community how um, the lighting isn't need to be left to the experts was a real focus of this event in a theme of the project. Um, and since we advanced through the district en masse in order to light the selected sites, we thought we'd turn it into a parade. So drawing on New Orleans second line tradition, we hired a local brass band to march and play alongside us as we moved from site to site. It was truly an amazing night. We learned a lot in the process. Um, there's detailed information about how to organize and design a gorilla lighting event in the lighting plan section of the website. Um, and the event ended with food and more music at a community park in the middle of the district, and it kicked off our community listening portion of the project. So a key point of difference of the Signal Station North project was our approach around the planning of lighting and the deep focus on community listening. And so the goals of this engagement process were to check our assumptions against what the community actually sees and experiences. So we weren't just guessing, as we often are, about what people want. Um, to identify people's values, the community values around light, what they want, what they value in their place and how lighting investment can support it, and to share our understanding of light and how light affects people. So we usually base our assumptions on industry standards and dialogues uh, with limited user groups, but in this project we were able to better understand how more a, a larger portion of the community want to use their urban space through direct communication. So a cornerstone of the community listening process was to um, extensive interviews with community members. And the responses took the form of a series of mapping exercises and narrative answers to discussion prompts. 
So what you see on screen right now is a composite map that consolidated community feedback to a range of specific questions that we asked about their current and desired nighttime use of various areas around the district. So the goal of the mapping exercise was to help us to better understand how community members currently navigate the district so that we could better understand how they would like to navigate the district at night. Um, so we asked them both what, where they go during the day, but also where they want to go at night. And then there was a real importance of language in how we asked these questions. And it was one of the aspects we iterated on and shifted and revised during the course of the community engagement process. We learned pretty early on that we didn't want to ask what type of lighting does a, a person who's not a lighting designer want to see in this location. Um, and instead, we asked questions of what kinds of urban spaces do you like to occupy at night? Um, we didn't ask where you feel safe, because we know people have biases that more life will make them more safe. So we asked them, where do you feel comfortable and where do you feel uncomfortable at night? And these questions led to narrative portions, um, you know, narrative feedback that were really much more open ended. Um, but that presented challenges for how we could summarize and consolidate and look for commonalities across what we heard. So this slide in, illustrates how we took direct comments for the interviews and then summarized them into brief statements about what the community, um, what lighting could do for the community. We found that if we asked the type of lighting people want in their community, their responses were often utilitarian, um, but their responses about values that they held around light were beyond the purely functional. So this community listening process provided us insight into how Station North residents and visitors think about lighting in the district, how their hopes and concerns for future lighting interventions might align and differ from what we generally thought of as good lighting design. So now that we had a better understanding of the community values around light and location specific feedback gained through mapping exercises, we'd analyze the existing conditions and the urban context, we needed to develop some concrete recommendations. So whereas a more typical approach might be to outline a prescriptive recommendations, um, for example, use this light fixture at this location or light this building in this way, um, we opted for an open framework that would give community members agency to support the range of a range of types and scales of lighting interventions into the future. So our goal was to empower the community to make their own decisions about what fit within a broader framework while allowing flexibility. Um, so to reach the community, in addition to the, um, to the uh, lighting plan, we also um, summarized in a really simple format these recommendations and posted them on social media. Um, and so, this path to place concept was defined, as you just saw, is two aspects of how the lighting plan could support navigation of the community around the district. And then this is an example of some of the specific concepts that we recommended. Um, so our conceptual recommendations were in, are intentionally flexible and applicable to multiple locations around the district. Um, we're very fortunate that the project funding has allowed three of the conceptual recommendations approaches that were selected by the community to be realized in projects that would demonstrate in in firsthand how these should work. So we're, we've been working in co-design methodologies um, with the design team of the community to advance these proposals and they're being implemented right now. So with all the sections of the lighting plan completed and the community and community use in mind, we created the Signal Station North Lighting Guidebook. And this is yet another summary of these practical recommendations, but also includes historical resources that were developed in the project. So it's a concise document of the completed project that's meant to be in an easily accessible format. Um, in the How Light Work section, we summarized the educational material that had been included in the lighting analysis again, with the goal of increasing the community's understanding of language around light, um, as opposed to just educating as a means to an end to get our designs approved. We included a community lighting guide that identified how to navigate lighting issues and um, to empower people to do that in a knowledgeable way. This actually came out of an early meeting before the pandemic where we had a community group and I mentioned this 
fact that somebody said they had light coming in their window. And I said, well, you could do a house side shield. And I got a look that no one had any idea what I was talking about or how they would go about getting it anyway. And so as soon as I described it a little bit, it became clear, this is part of what we need to do. It's not only about design in the way that might win an award one day, it's about design that helps a person with what they need and improves their lives. And we put together these infographics specifically with the hope that it would be clear how to navigate the city and the bureaucracy around light. Um, to complement the online resources, these project materials were available for free in the district in hard copy format. We had a series of branded newspaper storage boxes. Um, so the project revealed how decision makers at the city and utilities selectively engage with communities around lighting. Um, we understand that power required for these public resources to work for your best interest is a direct result of knowledge and collective will. So our gathering support section outlined steps for individual action that can help to build consensus and result in positive change to the lighting environment. Things like how you go about um, kind of engaging mothers in your community that feel the same way as you so that you have a more, a bigger voice. So there's so much more information to share on this expansive project, um, but I don't have that time. Um, there's so much more for us as a community to learn about how to design lighting in a more equitable and just way. Um, we hope that the examples shared tonight might support conversations about processes and outcomes of lighting design practices that better ac address equity and inclusion in the past, present, and future. And I'd like to end with an excerpt from the introduction to the Signal Station North project written by our, our primary project collaborator at the Neighborhood Design Center, Merrill Hamilton. Light supports our experience in public space in ways obvious and less obvious. It lights our way, yes, but it can also help us keep time, create a sense of place, or serve as a guidepost. And just as light can invite us in, it can also keep us out. Like so many aspects of the built environment, light holds power and reveals power structures. So let's work together to share this power of light. Thank you. Thank you, that's the end of our presentation. I put into the chat the uh, website for Signal Station North as well, for those who want to find out more information. We could hear each other, but we can't hear you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Todd. You see the chat? What? I do. I'm just wondering our, our host from Wild. I thought the panel discussion is next. I do too. Yeah. More on that later, Lauren. <laughs> we'll do a QA session at the end. Oh, there we go. Okay, testing, testing, testing. Good. All right. I can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, Glenn, sorry, we're just getting a little feedback here. Testing, okay. We good? Um, that was a great segment into the panel session. We're really here today to talk about um, how we can take what they just talked about and think about the city of Denver, think about what we can do here as lighting professionals. Not everybody in the audience is designers. 
um, but we really want to look at what they brought to the table in terms of the presentation and how we could apply that to our city. So um, without further ado, we're going <laughs> to we're going to introduce the the panelists. So Catherine, if you want to go ahead and start. I'm not an expert on this topic, but I'm hoping to share the voice, share my experience. Uh, and we're all in the conversation. And also that some of my passion for this really stems from a background. Of, I've worked on many, many projects in lighting design, special concern, as well as a multidisciplinary firm. But when we think about light for wellness, some of what uh, Ed and Glenn spoke about from the standpoint of behavioral health, there is so much that many of us work on where we're thinking about the wellness of people in spaces and we, when we broaden that perspective to all of us in the nighttime environment, there are a lot of similarities. So um, I'm humbled and, and just delighted to be here. Hi, I'm Leah Duran. So I'm the Development Projects Planning Supervisor with the City of Denver. So I work for Community Planning and Development. Um, just grateful to be here and part of this conversation. So thanks for having me. and. Hopefully, I can give some insight from the city's point of view. Yeah, we're really glad that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so first question is kind of a question for all of us, for the audience and the panelists. Um, what kind of feelings did watching that presentation uh, bring up for you, um, just as lighting designers in the community or as um, you know, other lighting professionals? We're trying to get to the heart of the matter here. and. Uh, were, was there any feelings that came up for you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Any of the panelists, any initial reactions from the presentation? More interested in what the, our, our <laughs> participants would have to say. Great, okay. We'll go ahead and get started then with the first question, which um, is gonna be directed at our two lighting designers um, up here. So the question is, given some of the issues discussed in the presentation, have you noticed environmental injustice or specifically light injustice in your work, in your personal life, in your travel? And if so, what's an example of that? I, I can speak to that, Addie. Um, I think we've all noticed this and, and, and obviously, you know, we can speak to the fact that we are seeing higher and higher requirements for light levels in a lot of our work. And, um, you know, there's this perception that safety is predicated on higher light levels. I live next to several law enforcement officials and I adore them. Um, but the belief is that brighter lights on, on our properties in a, and, and frankly, a relatively safe neighborhood for which I'm very grateful make everybody safer. I've had to have some uncomfortable conversations with my neighbors about their 4,000 K CFL Lambertian bright lights out in the lantern, unshielded glass in the front yard that spill into our bedroom. And so there's, even in, in quotes, safe residential environments, this, there's this idea that more light provides safety. At the same time, I think we all recognize that darkness across the board is not the answer. And so I think about Davis's office in Rhino, which um, is a, a warehouse district, and when uh, when we first occupied that office, Blake Street was a no man's land, and we ended up installing a series of directed down lights in a rhythm on the columns of the building that create this environment that feels really comfortable and really pleasant, like you could hang out there all all evening. So I think there is this. Um, this is a conversation and I'll kind of tee up some, some things as we speak more that 
there's ambiguity here. There's a lot of gray area where we're talking about the privilege of darkness and recognize that. But we also have to recognize the amount of overlighting that goes on. And, and I feel like I see that more and more. And it's just like the term wall pack. I don't know about all of you, but I hate it. Sort of makes my skin crawl, right? <laughs> right? So that's, that, those are some of the things I've observed. What about you, Catherine? Um, I, when we were prepping for this, I would, I would have to say as a, a woman, and then I want to include the non-binary folks in this, we've all walked down the alley that doesn't have enough light or has a really bright pool of light and then you know subsequent darkness and felt just uncomfortable and hopefully we're all lucky enough not to live in those areas but you I think everyone you know when you go to the grocery store at night you park near a, a pole because those are things that as women we've learned that's where safety comes from with lighting and so I think we're all inherently more aware of it than than we probably originally think about um, this is an interesting thing that's come up in our practice lately, not necessarily with exterior lighting, but with the quality of lighting interior in that now that we have everybody on video conference, there's this inequity of lighting skin tones in conference rooms. And we have had several projects where we've had to really pay attention to making sure we're getting enough light so that all folks are rendered equivalently regardless of their skin tone. So it's maybe less safety of an issue, but these are issues I think that can start to eke into other avenues of what we do as lighting designers. Thanks. So I was going to mention an example for me. Um, walking to the office, there's an underpass and uh, there's homeless encampments there and there's large floodlight wall packs up on the, you know, under the overpass. Oh, she said the bad word, wall pack. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and then they're not on. So if the lamp is out and then it, you know, it feels really unsafe. And so just like recognizing that this is, this is a thing that everybody feels and we just want to bring this uh, issue to light in this conversation. So hopefully you all are thinking about how that applies with, you know, different places you've been and, and how that's made you feel. And just to acknowledge almost everyone in the room is white. Like there isn't a, a diverse pool. We're all women, which gives us one aspect, but like there's a lot of people that aren't in the privilege that we are here that also have different experiences, right? There may not be the same experiences that we have. So um, so moving into the next section, Leah, do you want to talk a little bit a little bit about your role with the city of Denver, what type of projects you work on and what your kind of role sure. of responsibility is? Yeah. So our department reviews all new commercial construction, anything that's really three multifamily units or more. So the bigger stuff you're seeing downtown and then some major additions or remodel projects. Um, in terms of lighting, I don't know if you've seen the Denver Zoning Code, but Division 10 is part of that. Um, and it's a small part. Um, we've tried to make it better and better. And being part of this group, I'm hopeful that I can bring back some knowledge to our team to increase it even more. Um, so part of that division 10 is really focused more on um, eliminating adverse impacts to adjacent properties, um, as well as ensuring there's no glare, like I said. Um, and the second emphasis is really on architectural lighting and landscaping lighting. The first is safety. Um, so any new site development plan, that's what we call these major additions, new commercial projects have to come through us and we review those under division 10. Great. So what type of projects are you seeing when you say a site development plan? Are those, you said commercial projects, yes. are there certain areas that you're seeing this, you're having to review plans from more often? Yeah, certain, I think you can see the cranes downtown. So mm -hmm. you know where the majority of development's happening. Golden Triangle is really becoming popular. Rhino is very, very popular downtown. So those are our three major areas that we're seeing that we have the most control over. Um, I was working on a project with uh, one of my teammates the other day. It was a high rise downtown. I won't mention which one. Um, we've started to look at rooftop plans a lot more in amenity areas than we have in the past because we've had so many more high rises come in and they proposed 80 foot candles. Did and you say 80? 80. And it wasn't your firm, so you know that. <laughs> But I almost had a, yeah, uh, I am not a lighting expert by all means, that's why I'm here to learn, but 80 
I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I can see look on your face. Oh um, so it was really disappointing to see, did they hire a lighting firm later in the process? Did they not even look at standards? Did they not look at any standards across the board? Um, obviously, these are expensive condos, so we're not talking about um, these communities, but that was quite disappointing to see. So when you're looking at the photometrics, what are the types of things that you're looking for or looking yep. to minimize? So we are looking at um, anything from properties next to historic districts. Um, gas canopies is a big one, big one for me especially. Um, fixture heights, mounting heights, wall packs. Did you see a ton of those? <laughs> I know. Um, making sure no one's using a prohibited light source like an HPS. Um, what else? Parking area lights and um, another big one too that Lisa and I were chatting about the other day um, is the pool lighting on these rooftop decks. It's an interesting dynamic between the city and DDPHE, which is the Department of Environmental Health. They require like three foot candles around a pool deck. We require eight. So it's this balance of negotiating between two different city standards and an applicant that's trying to figure out what to do. Um, and so, yep, that's pretty much what we're looking at. So, so what I'm gathering is that the types of projects that she's reviewing meet some sort of ordinance are the types of projects that are building. New buildings, building developments where money's getting funded in. So there's a whole group of other people out there that just get to live with whatever light is on the street and or whatever light the local businesses happen to have and there's no real sort of code or anything to address the social impact of the lighting in that area right so the department of transportation we call them dotty and infrastructure they would review anything in the right of way and they i just looked at their lighting standards today that were developed um, i think in 2012 um, Clarion helped and another engineering firm, they follow the IES standards. Private development, privately owned, I should say, development um, is either a metro district or a homeowner. They can control what happens there. And so really the only ramification is if there's a concern, we direct residences to 311, which is the city service, you can complain, we'll send out a city inspector. But our lighting standards aren't really aim towards single family homes or, yeah, it's more for new commercial development. So I did, after this panel discussion, uh, I called in a different city, not in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I called on a, on a building that was, you know, having light trespass on our project and uh, actually requested that we help change the lighting on that. So. Just this is some of the things like outside of your jurisdiction of your your day job that there are ways that as just a citizen, you can start to make impacts on um, lighting just based on the knowledge that you, you know, and, and the power that you have. So um, the next question is for Ed and Glenn. Thanks for sticking around. Um, so, so can you guys speak to some of the consequences of unjust lighting on marginalized communities? Sure. Um, it was interesting hearing that um, Leah's domain is mostly in regard to new construction. Um, a lot of lighting and a lot of projects that, that get ignored are, are existing spaces. And if you think about marginalized communities, a lot of those places are being impacted by new construction. And people are, are basically, you know, uh, being displaced in those communities. Um, unfortunately, those communities are not being made whole. They're not being revitalized by, um, by the infrastructure. Now, it could be DOTs and other folks' responsibilities, but it's not just roadway lighting. We're talking about places where people gathered, and to Glenn's um, excellent example, identifying those community assets, those buildings, those places that people need to go to that have been ignored. And because they're old and they're in these communities that have lack of investment, they, they tend to get ignored. So uh, I live in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I can actually see places that are exactly like that as well. Uh, in Baltimore, you can absolutely see places that have been ignored and communities that have been ignored for quite some time. Um, I grew up in South Central LA, and there's a lot of communities and places there 
that are historic, but are, have been truly ignored. Um, and so I could go on and on, but there, there, are, there are countless examples. I think once, you know, there are neighborhoods that we typically don't go into, um, but if we open our eyes, if, you know, if you say as you're walking through an underpass as being homeless folks, um, that's, a, that's a kind of an unjust lighting situation too. And those folks are clearly unhoused, or, or they don't have housing, but also they're, they're kind of existing in a, an environment that, that is uncomfortable and underlit or just, you know, doesn't have adequate lighting for, for what they're doing. Um, those are uncomfortable situations and those are what I would identify as unjust or distressed lighting. And in, I can speak to what we discovered in the Station North project specifically, which is that there were areas of the district that had um, not received the LED conversions yet, and they were very poorly maintained. Um, and that was a persistent issue that the community had kind of complained about and was impacting them on a daily basis. But then when the LED conversions came through, the light levels tripled from what the city has communicated as the light levels that they're providing on the sidewalk without any community in, input. And I honestly don't believe that the that anyone was looking at the light levels in a critical way. I don't, I, 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 I claim, I think it might be um, trusting sales people that were selling them on fixtures that wanted to over, that wanted to make sure they were overcompensating in terms of light rather than undercompensating. Um, but I find it really obvious when you go to another neighborhood that has an LED conversion, whereas the, the marginalized community has 5,600 Kelvin, and then the neighborhood that's the affluent neighborhood has manages to advocate for 3,000 Kelvin in a quarter of the light. And it's in the same city, and it's sev you know, several blocks away. So it, it's these minor but significant changes that are impacting these communities. And and I think it also speaks to access to power. Who has power to make those changes in their community? Marginalized communities typically don't. I love what uh, Signal Station North has created a guidebook as to how to navigate these, you know, the public, you know, civic governmental uh, places and utilities. And I want to say utilities are on a hook too, because they're the ones who typically enable a lot of this overlighting, especially for LED conversions. And I um, take responsibility. I was in Massachusetts, working at a utility and enabled some of that to happen. And you're right, Glenn, they, they simply never paid attention to any light levels at all. It was all rule of thumb and poor rule of thumb. Uh, well, I, I, it's interesting hearing Glenn and Ed hearing you speak about 5600K, and we had a good conversation during the, the panel prep about the way that utilities come in, and if the utilities are funding or they're the ones who are maintaining the lighting, they're going to go for the highest lumens per watt, and we all know that that is a, a cooler color temperature, but I refer to it as the alienship effect of when we're putting 5600K or sometimes even 4000K in spaces at night, it looks like an alien ship has landed. And there's a really significant impact around circadian disruption. And the AMA, has, the American Medical Association, which is very, very conservative, has made multiple position statements about the adverse effect of circadian disruption and that that can be caused by excessive light at night. So when we discuss these effects, and this is one that affects all of us. So when we find the, the commonalities of um, conversations with clients, which that's, a, I think, a big part of this conversation is how do we have conversations with our clients and what's our sphere of influence for every one of us marginalized or privileged when we talk about exposure to excessive light at night, there is circadian disruption that is a possible affect and that's tied to mood disorders. When we think about what Ed and Glenn presented in terms of disadvantaged youths and behavior, the, the, the later time of sleep, um, all of that can be tied to mood disorders. There's, there are increased disease risks of not just cancer, but type 2 diabetes and all kinds of, of um, you know, mental and behavioral health issues. So it's a real, it's a real issue when we're talking about light trespass. And um, that's something that we can all speak to uh, 
our clients about and light trespassing to bedrooms is really significant. All right, so we're going to skip the next question and keep moving just in light of time here, but um, the next question is for Catherine. Um, have you been asked by a client to overlight an area to discourage or deter gathering um, to enhance security? How did you deal with it? Um, I mean, I think we've probably all been asked by clients to help them deter or enhance security. I think new builds maybe don't fall into that as much, but um, we've had a couple of clients that have existing properties, so they know where the hot spots of, of gathering at night are, and they, they want it targeted. And so I think it puts you in this interesting spot from a social standpoint, obviously more light in the areas where homeless people gather has effects of shame and those sorts of kind of social inequities that come with that. But from a business standpoint, we need to make the space we're lighting for our client and for their occupants safe and comfortable for their use. This is their building. They, they need it to be comfortable and safe at night for the people who are using it. So we kind of have to walk the line that, you know, you code only allows for so much light, IES only allows for so much light. And then there's a, a, a you know, a decent discussion point on educating our client that more light's not always the solution. Uh, better contrast where the light is, making the space feel better, you know, those sorts of things will help kind of maybe alleviate some of the security concerns. But it's it's a difficult line to thread because I think at the end of the day, to keep being lighting designers, we do have to make sure that the clients feel like the outcome is, has, has achieved the goals that they have for their site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Lisa, how can you navigate the dialogue with your client? <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we've done in the past is, and this has come into play, I'll give you a very specific example. We were working on a hospital in Leadville. If, who's been to Leadville? Okay, a lot of hands. Who's been to Leadville after dark? Okay, almost as many hands, so that's good. So you know how dark an environment it is. And the hospital that we were working on was up on top of the hill, and there was a very vocal neighborhood contingent that was very concerned that the new hospital construction was just going to have uh, offer, was going to include a lot of um, increased levels of light and have light intrusion. And this neighborhood group was, uh, the client was really having a difficult time. I'd heard a lot about it and I went up for some design meetings and there was a neighborhood meeting that evening. And I said, let me bring a mock-up. I'm gonna bring a sample of the fixture that we're talking about putting in parking lots. And we're going to just plug it in. We're not going to talk about foot candles. We're going to plug in the luminaire and let people see the way that the optics are going to be directed toward the hospital and away from the properties. The fact that we're using very warm CCT and that we're keeping the light levels as low as possible with high uniformity. And it was amazing, to, much like, like Glenn and Ed have advocated, and I, I jotted down Bob Park's nighttime lighting initiative. Um, listening and hearing the concerns of the people who lived in that area, but even more so, showing them that they were proposing and getting their feedback. Every concern was silenced after that. There, there were no concerns afterwards. And it was, it was almost humbling because I thought, these are the things that we, we as lighting designers know, and we inherently understand all of us hold ourselves accountable to do really great lighting design or to be very responsible in what we're thinking about on behalf of the city. But normal people don't necessarily understand. So navigating that dialogue, I would say, the more that we can show rather than tell, and the more that we're listening before we show, the better. And mock-ups, okay. going to Montana, <laughs> do you have your snowshoes? Maddie, Addie's doing a mock-up tomorrow night. She's gonna be wearing snowshoes on a mountain in Montana. So she can, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But that's a really, really powerful way for us to engage the community where we don't, they don't need to understand the technique. They get to see what we're talking about. Great. So Leah, kind of jumping back to you and kind of thinking about the city of Denver and hearing the conversation about the areas that are developing and then the areas that are kind of not developing or aren't really getting regulated or being left behind. Um, does the city have a perspective on any sort of plan or agenda to upgrade or make better some of the underrepresented areas? 
Yeah, so this was a tough question because I had to start time low. And <laughs> sadly, the answer is I don't have um, a specific plan. I do have um, some information that was given um, as part of the mayor's office initiative as part of Vision Zero, um, where in 2017, the city inventory every street light in the right of way. Um, and he shared that data with Excel. And this was in preparation of transferring um, all that high pressure sodium to LED. Um, but I was trying to figure out where did, where was this occurring first? What areas? And most of it, they, they told me was in phase one, which is focused on Federal Boulevard and Colfax, because those were the high energy networks. That makes sense, right? Um, and high energy from a vehicular standpoint? And pedestrian. Okay. Um, so I, I understood that, but then I, I poked further of, well, are we focusing on these underserved communities? And the answer was no, a lot of it has to do with budget. Um, so for me, this was a learning experience too, because I had no idea that, um, I had to write down all of this data that <laughs> the city is responsible, but Excel owns these. So they own about 51,500, 86% we can actually convert. Um, so if all 44,000 are converted, the mayor's office was quite excited that this would um, equate to $844,000 of billing, 22 million pounds of CO2 avoided, and 15 million megawatts of energy saved. Um, so I thought the more interesting part of this was that the city had to work with Excel and really negotiate with them to go from blue and bright to a lower um, temperature. So we really focused on that where Excel wasn't so concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so to date, only about 13,500 have been converted, but that's, that's one plan, right? Um, and then I was thinking about this more um, from what I do, and when I mentioned gas canopies earlier, I was thinking about Globeville, our neighbor to the north, right? A very under, underserved community. And how, what can we do? Um, and I've, I've noticed that a lot of gas stations are happening around this area, and mainly because they like to locate near interstates, um, major corridors. And so originally before the city amended the text, the Denver zoning code, we didn't have a regulation on gas canopy lighting. So I was seeing a lot when I was reviewing these before I was a supervisor, um, proposing up to 30 to 40 foot candles. Um, and these are directly adjacent to these homes. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine living directly adjacent to that. Mm -hmm. And so finally, Denver Zoning Code met. Um, we had some advisory committees come out. We got it down to 15, which is good, I guess, right? But I, I was hoping for a little bit lower than that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one thing that we could look at as a city is how do we focus our efforts? Um, is there flexibility in the code? Can we get out to that community like you were just saying? Um, to actually sit with them, speak with them, what's working, what's not working. Um, to me, that's something I could see being a huge value to these citizens. And are there any agencies or groups that are doing that right no. now? <laughs> no, so it would be, I mean, awareness brought to the mayor's office, honestly, I think that mm -hmm. would be the initiative or through CASAR, which is the Climate Sustainability Resiliency um, Committee that we have now as well. Great. So we're going to transfer to the last section in here and just talk about what can we all do locally as lighting designers. Um, so at least that's what just leaves me kind of thinking, what can I do um, to make a difference? And um, so we're going to ask the panelists, what can you as lighting designer to do today to help create a more visually pleasing and socially judicial outdoor public realm? I can, I can speak to that first, Addie. Um, one thing that really stood out to me from the presentation, and, and Glenn, I loved you showing the modular lighting, and, and I especially love the lighting sidekicks. Did you guys notice that with the, with the with, that are making these wonderful, delightful biophilic patterns? Remembering that light can delight is, is huge, and we have the opportunity to offer that to clients and to really bring that responsibility forward. Um, simple things like warmer color temperatures and advocating for lower light levels and more uniformity and, and asking the questions of the people who are going to be near these projects in addition to our clients makes a big difference. One thing that I've had great success doing, and it, it's more about just sharing, again, going back to the knowledge that we all inherently have, but 
we've chatted about this with your broader planning and zoning group when we've gotten feedback about, for instance, if you've gone through the SP, if you've gone through the regulatory project in the city of Denver and you have a bollard or a step line, you know there's going to be a peak candela point where there's like one point in the photometrics that's 25 foot candles, right? We all know that. Not because you have that as an average, not because the light levels are super bright. It's like the physics of the way the photons bounce. And so we've had great success with going out with light meters with municipalities and, and having people observe firsthand. Look, you can get that 25 foot candle point, but look at how comfortable the light is overall. And let's talk about uniformity. Let's talk about vertical illuminance. Let's talk about facial recognition. And when people see it firsthand, they get it. They get it and they start to know way beyond the numbers on a page. And that's the single biggest thing that I would say as a takeaway for me is the more that we can take our clients or the municipalities we work with out with our light meters and engage people in the conversation and the education so they see it firsthand and they understand it, the more they're empowered to change the way that they review lighting submissions and the way they think about lighting at night. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I agree with Lisa. Uh, I would say maybe from a non-lighting designer standpoint, to vote in local elections for folks that are paying attention to things like this. So they're hiring folks like mm -hmm. Leah who are paying attention. I think if you are in a community and there is a community meeting about a new construction project, go and share your voice as an expert in that community. Use, use our platform maybe not only for our jobs, but also for where we live and see if we can slowly have the, the benefit of good lighting kind of slowly spill out from, from at least where we, where we reside, which might help try to turn the tide. Great. Now, last question for Leah. Um, is there anything that we as lighting designers could do to help influence the way the code is written to build social equity into uh, the requirements of the exterior lighting codes rather than just from a safety or a technical perspective? It's hard. Text <laughs> amendments, um, we have a long list of them, right? What are the priorities? Affordable housing is the big one right now. But if it's a, it's a concern and we want it to bring it to the forefront, it's reaching out to the mayor's office to CASAR, the climate sustainability, but it's also becoming an advisory member um, that's, we've done that in the past and I can see really the benefit here. And just like you're saying, the training, um, we've started just on my team, which is only, it's 15 of us, but we review all these major commercial constructions, a training series. Um, and I would love to have a lighting designer like Lisa come in and just explain that 25 foot candles, because I guarantee most of my team does not know that. Mm -hmm. Anytime we yeah. have Yeah, <laughs> I know. You. Yeah, because we just Everybody see it in code, right? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> And we'd also prefer, because like I said, that there's that one group that came in with 80 foot candles, right? Well, why did you wait to the last minute? It's going to delay your approval process. We have this thing called a concept stage. Um, you're welcome to come in and talk to us where we, we weed out all these problems up front. Mm -hmm. But we find that developers aren't hiring the designer till the end, um, or they're even delaying the photometric. I've been requested to do that before they can log in for building permit, which is way too late because we do have standards and we want to protect the communities around us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. So you heard it, advisory <laughs> committee. Yeah. Uh, you can reach out to Lisa, I mean, Leah Lisa. right here. Yeah, and, absolutely. I'd love a <laughs> yeah. training series. And I think that's really, you know, Bridging, bridging these different um, entities is really going to be the solution to start making a difference. Um, we talked, it came up a lot in our panel discussions. There's just so many um, different channels that don't talk to each other. And so that's part of what this event hopefully is modeling that we can build bridges and learn from each other. And, you know, if it, if it isn't there, create it. If it isn't there, find the person that cares and connect with them. and um to start by having a conversation so with that ed do you have any um resources that you can share with the group or that you'd like to share well a couple of things i i, I love that being engaged with um but leah putting getting on the advisory board is really important um anytime that we can use our expertise and i invite everybody to engage with their local utility engage with um planners anybody who's doing uh, any type of 
changes within the environment for the lighting, participate in that process and use your expertise in a positive way. The other aspect, um, I would also, also, I wanna point out in the chat, we're talking about controls. You can control these lights too, and you can actually bring them down to half or more, and you will not impact, you can maintain the uniformity and, and will not impact uh, any of the community if you do it at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, we have that in our community. I barely noticed that the lighting's changed. So in residential areas, we can actually do those type of things, implement that. The utilities don't want to pay for it. They simply don't. And they're, they're cheap like that. You need to be on top of them to make sure that they pay for it, um, that they invest rightly in making the lighting work for everybody and not just for them, even if they own it. So that's one way. Um, the other thing I want to just promote again, in next week, look for lightjustice.org because that's going to have a whole list of citations and listings, including Signal Station North, as well as other type of resources for everybody to participate in. And we invite folks to give us their ideas, their case studies, uh, articles, anything like that, so that we can build up a, a, a community of resources to address light justice throughout, um, you know, throughout our industry. So that is what I had to offer. We're a little over time. I think we can take one question from the audience and maybe one question from the chat. If um, if anyone has a pressing question, feel free. If not, are there any questions from the chat that we could pull up? What was there was a first one I saw. Yeah. Or questions about what the challenges might be to, to implement this. Go ahead. <laughs> what was your comment or question? I see. So, so for the people online um, who are watching, your question is, if we add controls and visibility, which costs more, is it going to increase the overall property value and actually end up pushing people out? That's a valid question. Well, and I think that's where the city, I mean, there are rebates from Excel and for energy, but there could, that could be something that the city could look at, you know, as a potential, um, just like the affordable housing, you know, like the cost of, of the controls would also need to be, I don't want to speak for 
the city. I'm just trying to brainstorm. <laughs> yeah, good news is we don't have a huge lighting code, so there's not <laughs> too many restrictions. <laughs> but yeah, I don't have an answer actually. Though. Well, That's a good concern. question actually. Um, having worked with a lot of private developers, I would say that when we see when we see requirements at the city level like net zero or having low income housing units that, that are part of the requirement when there is market rate housing built, the developers are going to do what is required and there are funds to do that. I can tell you that straight up. <laughs> if there's not a requirement, then oftentimes it's not done. So I think when we're in a regulatory environment where the, for instance, the Climate and Sustainability Task Force that you've mentioned is starting to implement additional requirements, it, private developers build that into their model and it starts to happen in the projects that are built. So it, it's almost like the inverse of if we have those requirements at a commercial larger scale level, we start to see more of an impact at the city level. But I think your point around about single family residential is valid. There just aren't a lot of those requirements at, at the city level, at least here in Denver. So maybe a little bit less of a, a concern from a, um, an unattainable standpoint. Great, I think that's a great place to end and that's a great point to end on. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, if you have further questions, I know there were several questions online that we did get to. Um, Feel free to leave those up and leave your email address and we can connect you with the speakers um, if, if you have specific questions for specific presenters or panelists. So um, without further, further ado, you guys are dismissed. <laughs> and can we get a wrap up for our <laughs>